among the earliest evolutions of heavy metal and helped to cement this even louder, more abrasive new music as a global phenomenon. Not just one resigned to the new wave of British heavy metal coming out of England while a handful of other acts elsewhere desperately tried to keep up. The evidence lied in different pockets of thrash that were formed on the east and west coast of the United States, while Germany and Brazil were serving up something far more extreme in their approach to this speedy, galloping subgenre they were unwittingly inventing and redefining all at the same time. As teenagers the world over became enamored with gleaming, powerful melodies, technical guitar work, and epic lyrical content ranging from war to literature to death to smashing all who oppose, they quickly coveted a style they could call their own. Each faction did it their own way, and there were many common denominators when it came to their collective influences. So what made the thrash scene sound so radically different? Let's start with the U.S. before making our way around the rest of the globe. I think that, you know, the difference between the East and the, and the West Coast sounds when it comes to thrash uh, is the difference in the punk on each coast. Uh, we both used as the basis for our, uh, for our music um, a punk energy. Um, and what happened in, in New York, and me being the oldest guy in Thrash, I should know this because I was in college in uh, Manhattan College in the Bronx uh, during the punk explosion in New York City. So we had the Dead Boys. We had uh, the New York Dolls. We had... Um, you know, the Ramones were ours. But there was a certain vibe to that punk, and you added the new wave of British heavy metal to that, and I think that that's where that East Coast thrash sound uh, came from. Whereas on the other side, I mean, you're dealing with bands more so like the Dead Kennedys. Where it was, uh, it was just a different kind of a vibe. Ours, uh, our punk scene was, um, was very poppy to some degree. There were, uh, there were just those kind of, uh, uh, three-minute, uh, well-written pop songs uh, that had this over-the-top kind of a dirty energy to it, where the, the West Coast uh, punk was just a little bit different. West Coast punk was far removed from the New York style. There was a decisive attack and aggression present in such bands as The Germs <laughs> and X, <laughs> who, when coupled with the new wave of British heavy metal and some of its exports, namely Judas Priest, Iron Maiden, and Venom, really helped ingratiate what became known as the Bay Area style, as newly minted bands quickly gravitated to San Francisco when Los Angeles gradually became overrun by the burgeoning hair metal scene. Venom, in particular, had that scuzzy, unhinged sound that retooled the idea that metal had to be this super slick and polished thing played by musicians who had spent years honing their skills. The talent and the sloppiness of the first Venom album, Welcome to Hell, showed everybody that there's hope that you could be in a metal band. The fact that Kronos couldn't play the bass to save his life at that time, and you know, things like that, gave a lot of hope to a lot of people. If he could do it, I could do it. And I think it gave birth to a whole bunch of garage bands all over the world where people weren't virtuosos. At the crux of this thrash movement was not just accelerated tempos, but the rigid, galloping rhythms that were plucked straight from Iron Maiden. Of course, it's, it's that, that Steve Harris gallop, and it brought the drums along with it, and it, it had this propulsive sound um, that was really contagious through the metal community. A lot of people, people took that and ran with it. So instead of just this 4-4, four, four, you know, boom, psh, boom, psh, beat, you ended up with a much more tumbling type sound. In the West Coast scene's infancy, it was Exodus, not Metallica, who were crowned as the premier thrash band, the apple of the Bay Area's collective eyes. Aside from the ripping style, it was the visceral grit and unhinged theatrics of Paul Bailoff's vocal style that wielded influence over Exodus' peers, further defining thrash on the Pacific Coast. The identifiable uh, thing on the West Coast for sure was a difference in singers. Um, that there were, you know, you could distinguish each band because they, they had that Bay Area sound which was very similar from one to the next with regard to their style or the style, uh, but the singers were all identifiable. But I think over on the, on the our side of things, there were huge marketable differences between the singers. Not that we were more melodic or better, uh, but they I think had a uh, more of a heavier uh, machine gun kind of an approach to everything, which I thought was the first way of, or, or the first um, experience I had with rhythmic type singing, um, as opposed to just uh, standard melody. They were singing 
uh, within and on the drums, which was, uh, was really a kind of cool approach. The Bay Area sound was so established that it produced two bands that had an eerily similar overall sound. One year after Metallica issued Master of Puppets, Testament entered the arena with their debut masterpiece, The Legacy, which drew close comparisons to the ascending Metallica, and some fans even contended that Testament, with their sense of advanced guitar playing, were the next big Bay Area breakout. The Metallica Testament comparisons are huge, but the band is different than Metallica. It's sort of like a hybrid growing out of Metallica. You had in Testament, one of the differences, I mean, Kirk Hammett's a great guitarist, but Testament has Alex Skolnick. Testament has Eric Peterson. Meanwhile, on the East Coast, it was really down to a small handful of bands. Anthrax, Overkill, Nuclear Assault, they usually garner most of the attention with Whiplash and Toxic rounding out that bunch. Nuclear Salt's another great one. I mean, they're an East Coast band and, and just like us, and I think that they definitely uh, put it on the map in New York. They were singing about Cold War stuff too, but they also knew how to have fun. You could tell they, they had some songs that were just still kind of punk rock in a way, in a sense, at least with attitude. With the exception of Whiplash, all these groups maintained a more traditional, new wave of British heavy metal tinged vocal style, which was perfectly suited for those pop-leaning punk influences. And somewhere in between all of this, there was the crossover thrash movement, which tipped the metal-punk balance back into punk's favor, helping to shed the stigma that punks couldn't listen to metal and metalheads couldn't listen to punk. For me, um, you know, of course, uh, Cryptic Slaughter, I gotta give a shout out to. Um, we became friends with them too. Scotty, what's up, man? I hope you see this. <laughs> I thought that was like one of the cooler bands that was like, it was kind of sloppy, but metallic and just fast as hell. XL is one of my favorite bands that kind of oh, bridged time. the gap between thrash metal and punk. And uh, DRI, of course, was... Of course. Uh, Accused was huge for, for me too. Uh, like the buzzsaw speed picking. Suicidal was definitely on their own thing. I mean, it was almost like a brand. Like, I, I guess there was like, gang association, there was all this, uh, you know, and like graffiti association. It was more of like, I think, a whole lifestyle with them. And, you know, they were going for it. They probably got the most popular. All right, let's head across the Atlantic to our next stop, the always influential UK. Wait a minute. For once, the UK failed to be the mecca of a new development in rock and metal. And all these decades later, there's still not much thrash going on over there with the exception of a couple bands. I don't know why there's such a lack of thrash in the UK. Maybe Americans just do thrash better than us. We're fine, we'll just take, you know, we've got Zeppelin, the Beatles and Sabbath, like, you know, we'll take those three, you can have your thrash. Early on in the UK, there was Acid Rain, the quirky lawnmower death, Onslaught, Sabbath and Sacrilege but no band really garnered much widespread success groups from other territories experienced. During the 2000s thrash resurgence though, the UK's Evile and Gamma Bomb helped carry the torch. Let's go to Germany, the home of the Teutonic Four, Creator, Sodom, Destruction, and Tankard. This side of thrash was overtly evil sounding and aside from the happy time drunkenness of Tankard, it was by far the most extreme of all thrash's pioneers with California's Dark Angel and a handful of Brazilian bands not far behind in asserting that notion of extremity. The German uh, thrash stuff, I think they were, they were just more aggressive because, uh, again, just just any, like the elements, like you're saying with with East Coast and West Coast, you know, uh, the Germans just uh, th their their vocal delivery was just so uh, harsh sounding. And I think that's just from their at that time, you know, they're, they're still coming out of, of, uh, of the war and, uh, and just like growing up and, and seeing bombed out buildings and, and, and shit like that and just kind of, I think that would have some sort of effect on you and, and, and their, their image was just so much more extreme, you know, where, where East Coast and West Coast thrash was just more jeans and t-shirts and, and uh, street look whereas the european style with the with the all the leather and studs and bullets and it's just a lot more extreme creator has a very serious vibe there's no apologies there it's just like straightforward metal as f I, I would also say that they were like politically left which is cool for germans i think they spoke out against racism and like 
the evil history. The German thrash bands also played a large role in the development of the second wave of black metal that would primarily emerge out of Norway, with the Swedes taking up the call as well. Even Sodom's first album was pretty much a black metal album by those mid 80s standards. Keeping it extreme, the next stop on our world tour of early thrash is down in South America in Brazil. From poverty and hardship arose Sepultura, inarguably the biggest metal band to come not just out of Brazil, but all of South America. This scene, which also included Sarcophago, who were among the earliest groups to adopt the use of corpse paint, Volcano, and the controversial Holocausto, served as a foundation for new scenes. Black metal, death metal, and war metal. Like the German thrashers, these Brazilians played a gritty, lo-fi style that pushed metal into even more aggressive realms, and it, too, was born from a harsh military background. 1985 marked the end of a 21-year militaristic governmental reign as Brazil adopted a democratic form of government. Corruption, though, was rampant, and coupled with poverty, it was a breeding ground for the harsh elements presented in each band's sound, especially Sepultura, who towed that black thrash line on their first two albums, Morbid Visions and Schizophrenia. My mom got just a little bit of money, but not much, so we end up, had to move back to we, we live in Sao Paulo, but to move back to Belo Horizonte and live with my grandma in a in a uh, back room in her house, which was only like one bathroom, two rooms, very small, and we didn't have any money. And from that depression, from that pissed off environment, that's when metal comes in. One of the unifying factors across all these scenes were socio-politically charged lyrics that challenged authority and establishment giving a voice to the downtrodden while filling them with a sense of empowerment. These themes were another leap in maturity for metal. These musicians fearlessly voiced real-world concerns politicians seemed to distance themselves from and families were too timid to discuss. And it's all something that was common in the punk movements, which wound up having such a huge impact on Thrash's development too.